it's probably probably growing more all the time now in in uh, what it's become it adds a dimension to the community it it attracts bright people thoughtful people intelligent people experienced people who have ideas to share it's made a big difference i don't suppose we'll ever be able to put a dollar value on that not only in midcoast maine not only in the state of maine not only in our great country but known internationally but it's still an integral part of the city and the fabric of it. So it's grown immensely with a lot of public participation. It draws in people every summer, come specially to see it. Its Heart, a collection of paintings by mainly American artists, had been beating for several years before a structure was built to give body and life to the museum. Conceived as a tribute to the father of a wealthy recluse, the fortunes of the museum would rise and fall like the waters of the bay it set above, until the clarity of a unique vision gave it light. Today, as it celebrates the role of Maine in the history and development of American art, the Farnsworth Art Museum and Library pays tribute not only to William A. Farnsworth, but also to the community it calls home. Rockland, Maine, proudly independent and resilient, has reinvented itself countless times throughout the years, emerging today as the centerpiece of Maine's vastly popular mid-coast region. This relatively small museum, through its ever-expanding collection, inventive education department and community dedication has earned a national and international reputation seemingly unheard of in an institution its size. The Farnsworth continues to be the beacon that draws so many to the area while providing a lasting tribute to a family and community that so inspired its original benefactor. Nineteen thirty five, and the reading of the will of one of the town's most misunderstood residents reveals that the working class community of Rockland, Maine, is to receive an art library and museum. To be built in the name of one of the city's true lime barons, the William A. Farnsworth Library and Art Museum hardly seems an appropriate fit for a town powdered in the success of the lime industry. are abuzz at the news that Lucy Farnsworth, the last of the seven Farnsworth children, has in fact left the bulk of her estate to a town that mainly knew her from afar as she moved through its streets garbed in a long black dress and veil. Her trustee, the Boston Safe Deposit and Trust Company, begins preparation for the realization of Lucy's gift and plans move steadily forward until 1941 when the U.S. enters the war and, like so many others across the country, 
Rockland's sons and daughters are called to duty. The development of the town's new institution is put on hold, and over the next five years, the shortages and urgencies of a Second World War push the thought of the museum to the back of most residents' minds and the back pages of local newspapers. The building of the structure has stalled, but the collecting of the art it will house has not. The task of creating and operating the museum is assigned by Lucy's trustee to Harvard grad Robert Peabody Bellows, and during the early 40s, Bellows begins purchasing the museum's initial collection. These early acquisitions focus on works by New England artists, including those living and working in Maine. The early purchases seem to reflect a strong appreciation for the sensibilities of a Maine community, mainly marine themes and landscapes. And while Bellow's apparent frugality steers him away from some prominent names, the early purchases are represented by works from artists such as Thomas Cole and Winslow Homer. Even before it opened its doors, the consultant the museum hired began collecting the works of artists who were living and working along the coast of Maine thus establishing, inadvertently as it turned out, the Farnsworth's mission, and that is to celebrate Maine's role in the history of American art. I also look at it in a different way. We're celebrating America's role in Maine's history through the art that the Farnsworth collects and exhibits. Lucy's vision is clearly defined in her will. Her estate is to be used to create a library for the use of the public, to preserve the family home and its contents for public viewing, and that a building she owns on Main Street be used as an art gallery. From the beginning, it is clear to Bellows that the building Lucy has stipulated as the gallery space is not up to the task. He determines that a new structure should be erected to house what is evolving from a gallery into an art museum. In May of 1943, a row of 19th century wooden buildings on Main, owned by the estate, burn, and Bellows decides that by constructing a new commercial building on this space, one that will sit adjacent to the new museum building, the resulting rental income will serve as a financial ballast for the future operations of the new Farnsworth Museum. It was the formation of this complex, the museum, library, and homestead, combined with the retail space, that made it unique from other like institutions. Additionally, its location in the heart of downtown Rockland, rather than in a park-like setting, would lay the foundation for a truly special place the museum would occupy in the heart of its community. It's 1948, and the troops have been home from Europe for nearly three years. Rockland, like most of the country, is on an upswing. But I was very much impressed with Rockland at that time because 
It was a vibrant town. Everything was there. The A&P store, the First National store, there were a lot of local markets like Jordan and Grant. There were shoe stores, clothing stores, there were two movie houses. There was a great deal of traffic in Main Street at that time. Center Cranes was in Full Spring, a big department store, and there was Cree hardware that carried everything for a plumber or an electrician and sporting goods. And you could find about everything you needed. There were two cobblers in town. There was a couple of fruit stores. There were two pool rooms. And there were four barber shops. And a haircut at that time was a buck and a quarter. And my wife could get a permanent done for $10, which was excellent. And there was a great deal of activity on Main Street, and especially down Tilson Avenue, where the fishing vessels were then docking. We were coming into the beginning of the redfish industry in 48 and 49. They'd found out there was a big market, and, and General Foods uh, had come in just prior after Bird's Eye, which set up the freezer plant. So it was a great deal of activity uh, through the fishing industry, which brought a great deal of money in. The lime industry that had once so dominated the local economy is settling into its twilight, and a living pulled from the sea is swelling to take its place. Fishing and its processing have begun pumping energy into Rockland's post-war economy, and the announcement that Lucy's vision is finally coming to life rouses renewed interest and excitement in Rockland residents. But it, it was a tremendous change, and into the middle of this, all of a sudden was plopped this marvelous, modern, well-constructed building called the Fonzerus Museum. And it was fun to watch it go up. I, I don't believe the contractors were local because I remember the men that used to come over to the store for snacks, to buy snacks from us, were young, young men and uh, contractors, I think from Massachusetts, but I'm not sure. But I watched the building go up. We were all very impressed by the Farnsworth being built. It was right after World War II and it was a new building on a corner that was not particularly attractive and it was very impressive. It was very nice looking and, you know, it was classy. She was just part of the community. She was a little eccentric. My mother and her sisters were terribly frightened of Lucy. They wouldn't go anywhere near her. I only re remember her as a, as a small person in stature and a small person uh, uh, altogether. And uh, she, may ha she may have had fast skin. She was not a dark complexed. She was by all measure reclusive, never married, devoted to her father, and by most accounts an astute businesswoman. The only facts that seem to be of any certainty are her birth, her death, and her wishes for her estate. The thing that amazes me, she spells everything out in her will, what she wants. And she wants, and her, she has two wills, her earliest will in the early 1900s. Her main focus was to establish a Art, a library here in Rockland. But Lucy lived to see the Carnegie Library built. And her first will was very extravagant. She wanted 
to build several churches. She wanted an Orthodox congregational church <laughs> and she wanted several parks. She wanted a park in Thomaston named after her sister. She wanted a park here in Rockland. She wanted named after her brother. She wanted an art gallery that in uh, that would, was to be named after her brother. But she had all these different projects in her earlier. And I think maybe then, then the depression happens, which might've changed her mind. And then her focus becomes more of a, art library and art gallery so um, and and this house she wanted the Farnsworth homestead to be preserved as a house of its time there are no confirmed images of Lucy for years it was believed that a painting of a young girl holding hands with her brother was Lucy however discovery of additional family material later confirmed that the girl in the painting was in fact Lucy's sister Fanny Today, only one photo remains unidentified. Found with other family photos, but unmarked. Resemblance suggested is a Farnsworth, but no conclusive evidence exists. So in the family photos, you know, a lot of them are identified, but there is one ambrotype that was a photograph of a woman, young woman, and it, there's a definite family resemblance to the other sisters and to the mother in the family and the timing is right for ambrotypes and the age of the woman that it could be Lucy. It was said that as a child she possessed neither beauty nor merriment and due to the dynamic personalities of her sisters she became withdrawn and solitary at a very young age. Sent away, against her will, to a finishing school in Boston, there is speculation that her interest in art was first aroused during her years there. But growing up in a household with a piano, which she played, and numerous prints and paintings adorning the walls, it is much more likely that an appreciation for the arts had been instilled at a much younger age. One thing was certain. Upon her return to Rockland, it became clear that she preferred the affairs of business to those of the heart, and thus she remained unattached. Over the years, the legend of Lucy Farnsworth has grown beneath the cloak of misunderstanding. Much of her wealth was based on extensive real estate holdings, and her tenants would come to the dining room window where Lucy would collect rents making change from the cash she kept in a porcelain soup tureen on the table. She had in, taken her father's small fortune and invest, reinvested it. She invested in the stock market. She got out before the crash. I had an elderly, I had an elderly volunteer here once whose father was a stockbroker here in Rockland. And he told her that he made an appointment to see Lucy thinking that an elderly woman alone would be an easy sell. He comes to this house, spends some time with Lucy Farnsworth. He said he walked out of this house so impressed with what she knew about finances. And so she did, she took care of her, took care of her own finances. She invested in stocks and bonds. She invested in a lot of real estate. She did own a lot of real estate around in, in this area. And she actually puts in her will that she believes that uh, real estate is the best form of investment. I was impressed that Lucy was like that because there were a lot of women when I was growing up that didn't, didn't, they weren't in business. And I, I thought, you know, she did okay and all that money and, and uh, then donate it to the town because that really surprised a lot of people. And, you know, that was a lot of money back then. And she did her banking in Boston, and that's how she found the Boston Safe Deposit and Trust Company. Ralph Lowell, who was the venerable Lowell family from Boston, um, would tell this story every year. He'd stand up at that point, he was in his 80s, and describe Lucy Farnsworth coming to Boston to find where she could put her money and being thrown out of every bank she went to. Apparently she was sort of, he gave this wonderful story. And, and of course she went to the Boston Safe Deposit and Trust and was thrown out of there and on her way out this young clerk stopped her and said may I help you 
And of course it was Ralph Lowell who was clerking for his father, his grandfather. And that's how the Boston Safe Deposit Trust became the sort of uh, uh, the financial person for the museum. Yeah, what I heard how she selected the bank was, well, Lucy Farnsworth, being so frugal, always wore her 19th century clothes. So she dressed in black. She wore long black skirts that were, and her clothes were not in the best of condition. And she went to Boston, and the story I've heard is that she asked, she went into one bank, asked to use the ladies' room, and they refused her. And then she went to the Boston Safe Deposit and Trust Company, and they were very gracious to her. And so she came out and set up everything with them and got them to be the trustees. Uh, I thought that was a marvelous story. Uh, everything tied to a trip to the bathroom. Lucy had help off and on who, who lived in this house. We, had, we have a letter from one of the maids who lived with Lucy for a while. And one of the things she complained about was this house was cold because Lucy kind of rationed the coal that w went into the furnace. So you could tell that she, was, she watched her pennies. <laughs> she didn't spend anything, any money on herself. Penny pinching stories are abundant, but since many exist in more than one form, their accuracy remains in doubt. For example, it was said that she often sent her errand boy to the butcher to purchase a frugal five cents worth of scrap meat for her cat. But in fact, she had no pet. According to another version, she dispatched one boy and then sent a second to cancel the order because her cat had just killed a sparrow. All these stories, all these myths that we heard growing up about this mysterious lady. Now my father, had a store and a concession at the corner of the, across the street, Main Street, on the end of the Strand Theater. And we children had to do our jobs by helping out. We were a big family of seven children. We all took our turns keeping store, even at a young age. So the store had to stay open to seven o'clock at night till the movie theater was out. And I remember standing at the door and looking out the window of the door and it looked right up Elm Street to Lucy Farnsworth's house. And at night, I could see her walk through the house, through one floor to the other, holding a candle. In the days of electricity, I thought that was rather odd. But this was her way. She was she wanted to do things her way. remember shortly an episode with my mother and my mother in her early marriage lived in the house just in back of Lucy Farnsworth's house and my mother had done her wash and she had done it by hand for all her small children and she went out to string a clothesline to hang her wash so she picked the nearest tree and hung a clothesline when she came home the clothesline was down Lucy Farnsworth had come out from her house <laughs> and cut the rope to the clothesline. I'm sure my mother never knew who the tree belonged to when she hung the clothesline. And I'm sure Lucy Farnsworth was too much of a recluse to tell my mother not to. But this was a story that my mother related to me. For the most part, the people of Rockland maintained an uneasy connection to this little woman dressed in well-worn clothing from a bygone era. At one especially lean time in the city's history, it was said that the town fathers drew straws to see which would approach Lucy about a much needed loan. The loser rang nervously, and when met by Lucy explained the town's dilemma. Money was handed over with little question, repayment never called upon. Other times, however, Lucy had entered into litigation against the city and often threatened to move the headquarters of her father's water company to Camden to avoid Rockland's higher tax rate. As years passed, even though she built substantially upon the value of the estate her father had left to her, she refused to install electricity and lived only in the kitchen, the small bedroom in the rear of the house on the second floor, and in the dining room which had become her counting room. During the final years of her life, the front parlors remained closed and were seldom open to guests. 
We were teenagers in Rockland, Maine, and with very little to do. And uh, Lucy Fonsworth, uh, uh, well, I don't know why we looked at her as as a character. She wasn't really not a character. She was a small woman, and uh, she wore long clothes all of the time. And, and of course, the fact that she lived in a large home, and what we looked at as a nice home. And we decided, um, well, one of my friends decided, um, that we would pay her a visit. I can't tell you whether the visit was out of curiosity or whether at that age we were just kind and thought, Perhaps she would like to have uh, some guests. So we did knock at her door, and we told her that um, we, we wanted to come to visit her. And she did invite us in very cordially. She invited us in. But uh, she locked the door behind us, and, and uh, because of that, uh, it frightened us, frank frankly. We frightened us. In those days, no one locked the door, even even uh, even to let you in or to uh, for no reason at all so uh, and we did uh, she we did sit down and I, I, I remember something that stood out in my mind was she had a, a very large uh, baby grand piano a beautiful piano and I'm not so sure but I think there was a photo on that piano and she spoke only about her sister, and I'm terribly sorry, I can't recall the conversation. Uh, we were there a little while, and, uh, and we left. And uh, I will just uh, mention to you that, uh, that uh, we were glad to get out of the house safely. It's on Pleasant Street, and Lucy, well, all her family members are dead, and they're all buried in different cemeteries around the area. So Lucy decides to build a family cemetery here in town. And, and what I recently found out is if you, when you go look at that cemetery is that it was 13 acres when she planned it. It was family land. What she does, though, is she brings her parents back, all her younger siblings who had died at an early age. She brings her sister back, who's buried with her husband in Thomaston, but leaves the brother-in-law behind. She brings her brother back, who's buried with his wife in Belfast, but leaves her sister-in-law behind. So in this family cemetery, Lucy brings her family members back together. Finally, in October of 1935, at the age of 97, Lucy Farnsworth died alone in the bedroom she had used most all her life. After her death, many thousands of dollars were discovered in various forms scattered throughout the house, behind picture frames, in books, under the stair treads, and of course, in the soup tureen. The house she lived in stands alone as the only concrete evidence of her existence. Of course, when she died, we read the local paper, and uh, we were curious, uh, uh, more curious, because she did leave a lot of money, and um, some of the merchants said that uh, she was very frugal. In fact, uh, one mentioned in the store that she uh, traded, uh, you know, and bought groceries, she purchased one potato for herself. Well, you know, in, in those days, I don't know, I came from a family uh, of, six, of six children. I was the oldest of six, and then parents. And of course, maybe one potato was a big deal. Who, who lives, who eats one potato, or who has one potato in the house? But today, today, you know, uh, being alone, I, I go grocery shopping. I don't buy one potato, but I'll, I'll buy, say, two pears. You know, it's it's not uh, it doesn't. I don't think I'm frugal. Far from it. But uh, but in those days, they only well that I don't think I'm frugal. But, but perhaps if I had a great deal of money, somebody would say yes, I am frugal. I've really come to believe that 
that those stories are just myths and that she was just a recluse and this is the way she wanted to live. As stipulated in her will, the Farnsworth homestead remains unchanged. No furnishings have been added or removed. Everything remains just as it was in her father's lifetime. All the contents were purchased from 1850 when the house was built to 1876 when William died. Often when you visit an historical home, research has reconstructed how we think that people might have lived. But here in Rockland is a home truly frozen in time. This far-reaching legacy from a most unlikely source continues to enrich the place she called home. And when we move through the rooms of the homestead, we can only imagine what Lucy might have thought about her life and what she was leaving to the people of her hometown. Today, her generosity shines brightly at the center of Rockland, and as the headline in the August 17, 1948 edition of the Courier-Gazette reads, Rockland is justly proud. I uh, don't think I ever went to an art museum before that opened. My father would take me to the openings. Um, it's what gave me an appreciation for art. It started at the Farnsworth. Well, I, I remember when I was oh, probably all of five or six years old having art lessons at the museum. Uh, Wendell Hadlock was the curator then, and of course he was a friend of the family. That didn't improve my art talent any, which is why I'm not any kind of an artist. But even then, the museum was a community center. Miss Lucy's uh, will stated that she particularly wanted this building to be in use by the people of the local community. She wanted it to be open to them. I went through Hadlock, whom I liked and was reachable upstairs. He was a gentle guy, and I knew B. Grant, his secretary. And it was a different type of museum. You'd walk in, feel free, and everything. It was very pleasant. It's more structured now. Has to be, I guess. Yeah, they just can't have every Tom, Dick, and Harry galloping through, ripping stuff off the wall. Farnsworth has been a, um, you know, very important to my to my family. I mean, certainly my father had his earliest shows here, and uh, and I, in fact, had my first museum show here at Farnsworth when I was early 20s. So it's been a uh, integral part of of our of my family. Uh, Andrew Wyeth used to come in and have lunch with some of his family, and. I knew who he was, but he wasn't as uh, famous as, as he became. But he would come in and they would eat. And I had a guest book that I kept on the uh, cash register. And he signed the guest book. And the next day after he was there once, uh, a woman came in because they were having a show at the Farnsworth one of his first big shows at the Farnsworth, I think, but it was very well advertised and we had a lot of people come that summer. 
and the woman looked when she went to sign the guest book and there was Andrew Wyeth's name. And she got so excited. Uh, she said, he was here? And I said, yes, he comes in fairly often. She said, I'd rather see Andrew Wyeth than the President of the United States. Everyone who knows anything about um, American art knows about the Wyeth family. And uh, they uh, they certainly are closely associated with the with the Farnsworth, uh, and uh, that I think adds a dimension. My grand my grandfather died before I was born, so I loved his work, and I used to love to come and look at his paintings here, and uh, and so the the museum played such an enormous role in my childhood that it would have seemed peculiar not to come to the Farnsworth. I mean. If, you know, unlike most kids my age, I think, it, you know, it's a little different perspective that I had. The Farnsworth was, was part of my life and, and part of uh, a painting, and this is where you showed your work um, to the general public and so forth. So it's, uh, you know, sort of unique perspective. The, the Farnsworth each year sponsored a, a student art show in the big, I think it's the Hadlock Gallery, and when it was all just white burlap and you stick little sticky round things with paper clips into the burlap and hang it on the wall. And uh, one thing I particularly remember is uh, in, in art class, I got chosen to be able to hang the show. So I got to get out of school to come to the Farnsworth to hang, hang art. And that was great. Skip school to go to the art museum and play around there. So that was always great. And it was always, it was, it was pretty impressive to see my own work and my fellow students' work in a museum. Well, any show to me is a terrifying event, and so I recall my first show here was was a terrifying event. I mean, it was, you know, it's one thing to have a show in a gallery. I'd had shows at a very young age in New York and in various places, but this was a, a museum is quite a different kettle of fish. and. Uh, and as, as familiar as I was with the Farnsworth, as part of the integral part of my life, all of a sudden now it was a museum show. That's a whole different world for a painter. I mean, that's putting you up against the collection here, other painters and so forth. And um, so my recollection was really sheer terror, you know, having a, a you know, here's a familiar face. But, and and that I remember the opening was, a, it was a, a lot of people. It was kind of a mob scene. and. Uh, and that scared me even more. So I wish I could say it was a wonderful <laughs> experience, but, but, it, uh, but certainly in a, a rite of passage. And um, I then went on to have you know, other shows. But, but um, so again, the Farnsworth uh, has a very sort of uh, uh, part of my heart that I'll always keep. For some 20 years, Rockland had enjoyed an economic summer delivered primarily through the strength of the fishing industry. But as the 70s opened, the economic climate began to change, and soon Rockland and the Farnsworth would be forced to weather new challenges. As an energy crunch that was choking the country swept into Rockland like a cold winter wind, the fishing industry began rapidly changing. Shifting global markets and a dwindling supply soon washed away many of the fishing and fish processing jobs that had been the strength of the local economy. The growth of suburban shopping centers added yet one more hardship that signaled a shift, and soon downtown Rockland was but a shadow of its former self. Well, it was, it was a tough time. It was a transitional time for Rockland. Of course, for generations, Rockland had been a seafaring, uh, shipping uh, port, uh, and uh, of course was one of the preeminent uh, fishing uh, ports in the Northeast. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, 
the whole profile of the siding canning and fish processing industry was changing and many of the old uh, factories and companies were moving, going out of business, uh, in, in many ways succumbing to the uh, foreign fishing pressure and the international trends that were taking place economically throughout the world. So that was a period of time in the 70s in particular where the old was, was, was leaving and deteriorating and no one could imagine what the new was going to be. I remember going up and down Main Street and seeing a lot of stores that were kind of shabby and uh, Main Street was, was nothing like it is today. Uh, and you wondered what Rockland's future was going to be. And well, we moved back to Maine in uh, 1977 and I can recall going down the main street of Rockland and seeing the number of empty stores and sort of boarded up places. And Rockland was, uh, you know, in, in fairly tightened straits then. The uh, fish packing plant was still running but about to shut down. Uh, the Farnsworth was kind of a sleepy museum with, uh, uh, with a furniture store on Main Street. Uh, upstairs in that building were a bunch of officers, some lawyers and so forth. And uh, Marius Pelado was uh, struggling mightily to keep the museum active and uh, uh, Marius is a scholar in his own right. Uh, he, uh, when they did have exhibitions, uh, that were of note. He, he was capable of writing the catalogs. Uh, he was a, a good lecturer. Uh, Marius made a great contribution to the museum. One of the key points in the museum's history was in 1977 when then director Marius Pelado invited Louise Nevelson to do a major exhibition of her work here. Nevelson by that time was a internationally renowned American artist, and arguably one of the most important women artists the country had ever produced. What was different about her work, of course, was that it was purely abstract, thus departing from the long tradition of art making along the main coast and the kinds of work that were being collected and shown here at the Farnsworth. When Louise Nevelson came back to Rockland for her much advertised uh, exhibit, which I felt was a real reconciliation with the community, the reading corner where I worked decided to do a large window telling that Louise Nevelson was coming to Rockland and that this exhibit was happening and a little bit about her career. Putting this window in the uh, night before the opening of the exhibit, it took a long time until probably four o'clock in the morning. I was exhausted, got the window all set up, went home, went to bed. At nine o'clock, the phone rang, and it was Louise Nevelson. She said, I've just seen your window, and it's marvelous. One of the reasons Marius Pelado wanted so eagerly to show Louise Devilson's work here was because she grew up in Rockland. She moved here as a young girl, was raised here, attended Rockland High School, and that's where she began her interest in art, which of course led her to a career of international fame. I was pleased when uh, Nate Belosky, uh, Louise's brother, uh, left a lot of her things to the Farnsworth, and then she had shows there. And come to find out the things that we thought were rather strange, those assemblages of wood uh, were really quite famous. My sister lived in Louisville, and I think they had either a big show or a permanent show in Louisville. And I was quite impressed when I went down there to think that, wow, uh, someone from Rockland uh, has uh, made a name for herself in Louisville, as well as New York. My grandfather Dondis, 
went to Ellis Island and helped bring the Belowskis in. And he and, Nate and Louise's father were cousins somewhere, second cousins or something. Mm -hmm. I don't think they were first cousins, second or third cousins. My mother said she was a very beautiful girl. And she said they married her off to Nevelson. He was a man from New York with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And Louise wanted a career. My mother was friendly with her mother, and that's how I happened to know Louise. And of course, I knew, I knew uh, Nate Bluffsky. You know, uh, don't forget I was a lot younger, but I knew of of Louise and uh, Nate Bluffsky. Nate Bluffsky, and uh, I know that, uh, and they, she became very prominent, I guess, in New York society and so forth. She was amazing and reached great renown in New York City. And Nathan, as you know, uh, grew up here, a poor young man, and went in the Navy and came out and worked very hard and started to acquire property and reinvest it. And he assisted his sister very, very much. And I met her quite a few times. Nevelson was quite the woman and is very well renowned today and very highly thought of. By the early 90s, signs of a change were beginning to show. The Farnsworth II was looking toward a rebirth of its own. Several years earlier, a change in the museum's charter allowed for the formation of a truly independent board. Determined to grow beyond the limitations of Lucy's initial gift, this new group of visionaries forged a plan for both fiscal and physical expansion and began to raise the money that would be needed to grow Lucy's gift into more than just a regional museum. We had a concept of doing a fundraising uh, to help to build endowment and to help to modernize the museum by expanding within its own footprint and doubling our exhibition space. That was accomplished by actually taking over the, uh, the whole office building and on the first floor uh, having a shop and uh, a gallery. Chris Crossman uh, repaired what had become a relatively distant relationship with the uh, Wyeth family. And uh, we went down to visit uh, in Chad's Ford and uh, met with the Wyeths and encouraged them to look at this museum as a major repository for their papers. And uh, the approach was that it wasn't just Andrew Wyeth, it was the three major Wyeths, and N.C. Wyeth, and Andrew, and Jamie. And that, that appealed to them, and uh, uh, the rest is history. It went on from there to a further expansion, and the Wyeth galleries, and of course, uh, that really put us on a tourist map. It became a destination to come to see the Farnsworth. I think the Farnsworth has, um put Rockland on the map. Uh, the Farnsworth, I, I've heard about the Farnsworth all over the country. Uh, some, some of it because of the Wyeth family and some of it because people like Louise Nevelson who grew up here uh, and was world renowned. The thing that I love about the Farnsworth is this diversity. Um, you know, it is not a Wyeth museum. I mean, they, you know, they'll have an Andrew Wyeth in one room and, and they'll have a complete opposite, like Ken Noland, with color field paintings and targets in the other room. That's the fascinating thing about it. And, and so it's, it's grown from just sort of being a regional museum to really a national uh, a presence. The Farnsworth has been very careful. I mean, the, the work that they've been collected and put together and present, I think, is a real cross-section of, of, of this um, amazing pool that Maine has, two painters and writers and so forth. Um, so it's, it's a colliding of worlds, which makes it even more unique. Uh, you know, it doesn't pander the museum. It, uh, it's, it's, it's really, a, it's, it's its own institution. Just as in a main spring, life was slowly emerging. The closing of the fish mill plant and the cleanup of the once proud harbor were making Rockland a more inviting place to visit and the community's Carnegie Library underwent a much-needed renovation and expansion. 
like flowers from a once frozen soil. New businesses, large and small, began appearing, and the addition of a new location in Rockland for the credit card company MBNA resulted in the creation of a new boardwalk and other improvements to the city's waterfront. As Rockland searched for a new identity, a longtime favorite event that too had found hard times was re-energized, and the Rockland Lobster Festival once again became a must-visit for people from Maine, New England, and across the country. Today, it has been joined by other equally popular events, such as the North Atlantic Blues Festival and the Maine Boats Homes and Harbor Show. A revitalized downtown offering new shops, fine dining and galleries, and crowned by a renovated and restored Strand Theater, offers yet more proof of the renaissance that is swept into Lucy's hometown. So they know Rockland, Maine because of the Farnsworth. And, and I think it changed Rockland from being, Rockland used to be a pass-through town. People on their way to Camden or people on their way to Bar Harbor. Well, now Rockland's a destination town. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, I was quite surprised when I was asked about the Farnsworth in Sydney, Australia. I remember I was there on a diplomatic uh, uh, mission uh, and uh, at a reception uh, hosted by the ambassador this particular night, an Australian woman who was very interested in American art asked particularly about the Farnsworth and I told her with great surprise and great pride that yes I was well aware of it because it was in my hometown. So uh, of course she wanted to know all about it and had hoped to come and visit at some point. So yes there is very definitely an awareness at least in some circles uh, across the country and even overseas. But the Farnsworth Museum, I've always felt, was one of the core units of Rockland City. It brings a lot of people in. It's expanded. It gets, I believe, very good support. So it's a very powerful center for all of us here. I mean, this is, after all, a nationally, perhaps internationally known museum, uh, very highly regarded. And there aren't very many communities of Rockland size in the country that can boast a facility with the, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, quality and caliber of the Farnsworth. And I think many people do realize that. Uh, those who are not particularly attuned to uh, art may not appreciate it as fully as those who are. But it is true nevertheless, and the more people who understand that, uh, the more they'll see the reason for the, for the pride. August 15, 1948, and at long last, a gift that seemed to most so out of character is a reality. Ralph Lowell, president of the Boston Safe Deposit and Trust Company, along with the museum's first official director, James M. Brown III, welcomed the over 1,300 attendees. Uh, Jim Brown was the first director, and we met him and his wife, Alice. He was a very gentle man. He had been a prisoner of war of the Germans. He was the sole survivor with a buddy off of a yacht called the Cythera and had been torpedoed and spent his life in the early part in the prison camp in Germany. And 
and came out and uh, finished his Harvard education and got this appointment. And uh, it was very impressive to us to meet him. He was a very kind gentleman and showed us a lot. In ceremonies held on the Homestead lawn, Brown states that the institution will become more and more a civic center. The extent to which it will go on in service depends solely upon the people's acceptance of the facilities offered. He added, although privately endowed, it is in every sense a public institution. Principal speaker, author A. Hauk of the University of Maine, tells the crowd that the influence of a cultural establishment of this nature reaches far beyond the community in which it is located. No one except possibly Lucy Farnsworth herself would have dared dream just how fitting these words were. It was just her way, I thought, that doing things. She wanted to be left alone, and this is the way she lived. And I thought then, when they built the museum, I was really in shock to think that anybody would do this for the town, because we were a little town, and we didn't really have the benefit of the arts and music and theater that you have today, even on a local basis. We're so fortunate, and the Farnsworth brings out the best in all of us because we're very proud of the Farnsworth. We're very proud of Lucy's legacy, vision. A center for city and, and local activity. Certainly, it's something to be extremely proud of. It's been a fabric. Farnsworth is a fabric ingredient, key ingredient of the greater Midcoast community. To this day, then and up to now, no Rockland resident has to pay a fee to go to that museum. And I have enjoyed many years of going there and, and able to enjoy the, the art and exhibits. And I learned an appreciation of art that I don't think I ever would have been able to be exposed to.